My name is Darcy White with Clarion Associates. Um, thank you all for agreeing to participate on the General Plan Advisory Committee. I know several folks have participated in um, other meetings this week as well. We had a community meeting last night um, and another one this morning. So um, some folks have, have had an opportunity to dig in a little bit deeper, but we'll try to um, keep this discussion to um, move it along. I think there's a lot of information to go through. Um, just a quick question before we do get started. I'm curious how many of you um, have had a chance to at least take a quick skim through the packet materials that were provided. Everybody kind of have, okay, fantastic. Well, that'll make, make it go a little quicker here today, and we'll try to um, uh, get through this quickly as possible. So, um, so my colleague Elise Denisenzo is running around here as well, so she's going to be working with me on the general plan process. I know several of you have also met um, my colleague Don Elliott, and he is working primarily on the development code update. So we are doing those two projects simultaneously um, for a variety of reasons, um, to make sure those two documents are in sync in terms of the policy end of things, the vision, as well as the regulations. So, um, purpose of today's meeting and this committee is really just to focus on the general plan. We have another committee um, focused on code issues, and so we're kind of working together with those different groups to, to make sure everything's in sync. So, um, in terms of, um, just to give you a quick, uh, quick overview of the process and then we'll just dive into discussion because we really want to spend most of today um, hearing from all of you. The general plan, as many of you know, is really kind of the long-range vision for the community, 10 to 20 years. Um, policy, not regulatory, so it, it really informs the regulations that um, guide growth in the community. So this is an important document um, and something that um, really is the framework for how the original vision for Lake Havasu City gets carried forward. So. Um, in terms of why we're doing this update now, um, last update was in 2002. Just out of curiosity, I know that Don here was part of that process, and there are others as well. So how many of you were involved in the last plan update? Okay, Stu, we got four. So that's the, yeah, so we've got some continuity there, um, I think, in terms of, of how that plan came together. But I think the key message um, about the update, other than, you know, there are some legal reasons why this needs to be done, but I think it's also a chance to just step back and say, are we headed in the right direction? We've got 10, 10 years under our belt now based on that plan. Um, what's working? What's not? Um, what type of shifts might we want to make in our direction in terms of where we want to go going forward? And that's really where I think this group can kind of help guide us in terms of what you're seeing from your different perspectives um, in terms of how the plan might be working well or not. So um, the other major threshold that has happened that's triggering this update is the, the 50,000 population. And you know, with that comes some, some new requirements that we need to integrate into the plan. And what we've been telling folks is it's, it's not so much that the plan, um, the current plan that you have doesn't really address these things, it's just a matter of um, formalizing that um, and adding a little bit more detail to address some of the new requirements. So you can see on the, the left side there is the set of elements that's addressed in the current general plan, and on the right is kind of an expanded outline that really the, the, the black ones that punch out there are the new elements that need to be added. So, so we'll be focusing in um, in a little bit more detail on some of those issues. Um, and again, kind of working from, you know, the foundation that was built into the original plan. I, I feel air moving. That's good. Um, um, public involvement is, is a big part of this process. We're going to rely on this group, I think, to be kind of, you know, not just to get your direct input, but also to help us serve as a, you know, you guys are a conduit to the larger community. And you have conversations with folks on a daily basis who are probably interested in this plan but may not know what's going on. So, um, you know, any help you can give us in terms of helping get the word out about meetings. Um, this time around, we actually also have uh, an online survey that will be available through the end of the month. So um, we're asking for input, you know, today and, and last night, but we're also asking for it really through the month of September. So we're hopeful that um, Stu's got a radio spot probably next week. Um, the mayor is actually going to announce it um, on his regular spot today. So we're hoping to kind of get a lot more input through that as well um, over the coming weeks. So um, we, could, we would appreciate any help you can give us on that. Um, all of the information 
as we go through this, if people ask you, it's all available on the project website, which is uh, the city website. There's a, a tab there on the left-hand side for the general plan and the development code. Um, so anything you need, anyone ask you about it, it's all, it's all there along with the meeting dates, et cetera. Um, in terms of the, the plan process itself, while the, the combined process for the code and the plan is going to take, we started early this year, so around March, April timeframe, that's going to take a total of about two years, so into 2015. But we're really focused on the general plan now, between now and the end of the year. So we've been working over the summer on the plan assessment. Um, and our hope is to have a pretty solid draft of the plan um, by the end of the year. And that means um, coming back to this group and the community with a preliminary draft plan at the end of October. So we'll take everything we've learned from these meetings, give it our best shot in terms of integrating those ideas, um, and bring you back uh, a draft plan to look at, make further refinements, and then be back again in December. So you'll have uh, a couple rounds of this. Um, but I think from the committee standpoint, that means that you're your time commitment will be pretty focused, which you know I know everybody's busy and, and that's, that can be helpful. So it'll pretty much be tw between now and the end of the year um, where we'll be working with this group. So we will be um, back um, before we get into that. Um, the, we'll end with that, but just a heads up that we'll be back October 30th will be the next committee date. Um, and then um, I've got the other date up there. It's, I think it's December 3rd or 4th after that. So before we wrap up today, we'll make sure and get that on everybody's calendar. Um, in general, does this time work for everyone? I know Stu and I were just chatting in the hall. We'll make sure and bring lunch in for everybody next time. I apologize. We didn't do that this time. Um, so um, we'll, we'll definitely do that. But in general, does this time work for everyone? Is this workable? OK. All right. All right. Well, with that, um, I think wanted to just spend a couple minutes on um, kind of what the, the goal is with this group. And we've talked a little bit about um, how, you know, we'll be bringing work products to you. You'll get a, ch a chance to give us direct feedback. I think the other role that the city council has envisioned for this group is really to kind of serve as a conduit back to them. They would really like to hear from the committee um, about process on the plan and progress and kind of, you know, how that's going. And so I wanted to ask if there are, um, you know, how we want to do that. Is there a, a representative from this group that would, you know, feel comfortable doing updates on a periodic basis? And, you know, that's really something um, for you guys to, to kind of consider. So does anyone have any immediate thoughts on that? I mean, it could, could be that after each meeting with us, you know, there's a, within the next couple of weeks, there's a follow-up discussion with the council at one of their, their regular meetings, just an update. The other option would be, you know, providing it in written form. Um, it's really at the pleasure of the group. So does anyone have any um, ideas or suggestions on that? Dean? Okay. Okay. Just kind of highlights of what's what's been going on and and what's going forward. Okay. 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 Group together. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Well, we will proceed with that um, that assumption and and move forward that way then. Um, what we'd like to do now is, now that we've got some air moving and hopefully everybody's feeling a little better, um, is to dive right into um, the materials that we sent you. So there were two documents um, that we sent, the community trends and data. And that's really more of a, a background document. You know, if you have comments on any of those, I think that we've already identified a few things that need to be refined. If you have comments on any of those things, um, you can either tell us now or um, you know hand them to us after the meeting. It's up to you. Does anyone have any burning issues or suggestions on that document that you want to get out on the table? <laughs> it's the shorter one. Okay, okay. And we figured that would be the case. So as I said, this is just kind of background stuff and we can work with staff, so. I have a question uh -huh. on how some of the trends uh, were accomplished. Are the trends 
a continuation of what we have, or is there some study that has damped that with the economic factors that we have? In other words, these projections of growth and so forth. How, I mean, I know they're pie in the sky to a certain extent, but how are those numbers accomplished? That you're talking specifically about the population numbers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so those are based on state level estimates um, and historic trends. Um, so there's analysis done, um, you know, looking at where we've been, where we're going. It's an estimate, um, you know, and I think probably based on what we've seen, it, you know, it's it's kind of tracking with it's just under one percent, you know, if you if you if you do the math on that. Basically, we're at uh, right around 52,000 um, population now, looking to be about 66, 67 over the next 10 to 20 years. So um, it's it's reasonable, but I think you know that takes into account that there's going to be some some fast years and some slower years. So, any other questions or comments on the trends document? Okay. Well, why don't we dive into the plan assessment since that's kind of the big focus here. And I think what we'd like to do um, is maybe just kind of walk through each of the pieces. Um, so Elise has gone through and um, done a preliminary summary of the meeting, kind of what we've heard from folks so far. So for each topic, I think what we'd like to do is give you a couple minute overview of kind of what we're hearing on each of these subjects and then you guys can weigh in and let us know do you agree do you have other ideas and we can kind of work through it that way does that sound all right okay um, first up is the vision you want to dive in? I guess I'll dive in hello everyone if you haven't met me I'm Elise Genesenzo I was running around like crazy I'm glad that it's a little bit cooler now I think everyone can focus um, so on the vision we really heard that it needs minimal revision. Uh, it's a really good statement. Uh, however, with the expanded population, there might be some opportunities to include mention of encouraging cultural diversity, um, more specific mention of how to slow growth or manage the growth, uh, and another specific mention to encourage the ASU expansion, whether that's expansion academically of the programs they offer, or expansion of the campus itself. Um, and that was really it for vision. And if you haven't um, noticed, we've got, that was the one of the worksheets from the meeting, if you're, just so you have the, the actual vision statement in front of you. Um, and what we've been asking folks to tell us is really um, how close that is to where you think you wanna go in the future. And then if there are other big ideas that you think that need to be, need to be captured as part of that, so. Any reactions or comments? Same here. Yep. Yep. Oh, sure. Jump in. We'll give everybody a minute to yeah. digest here. <coughs> Dean? Uh, evaluation. Last night was the. Uh, uh, I think that that what we're going to experience in the next several years is the, basically the same thing we have for the last several, and that's a very s slow but very consistent uh, growth, always on the plus side, but uh, much slower than we did say six or eight years ago when we were in the boom time. So try to level that out and. Uh, and I think that's that's probably consistent with most of the economic uh, forecasts that I've heard, at least. And uh, so, well, really, that's the only thing I had. I was here this morning, and uh, I was with a group of four people. And on this particular one, our vision uh, we felt that the part that 
describes job opportunities with excellent wages, that the word excellent should probably be a different word. And I suggested livable, and I didn't write down what the other people suggested, but there were three or four other than excellent. And then the last sentence when they're saying residents, residents and visitors enjoy big city amenities, we thought the word big city was just a little overkill. I only had a comment regarding, again, the big city thing. I don't think that fits. Um, people did not move here to be in a big city. I actually kind of like our existing vision, and I like it specifically because it does not say world class. I'm tired of buzzwords. I would like that when we get done building our city that we can look back and say this vision is kind of what we got and I think that would be a great achievement. My only comment about it though is that we used to have it in the chamber councils on that wall so that every city councilman could see it as they were getting ready to vote to remind them of what our goals and our vision was and I just now noticed it's no oh there it is Bill's got it it used to be hanging on the wall and it's, it's not there anymore so maybe maybe we should add that back to the wall. I didn't have any comments at this time other than that uh, basically the plan in general looked fairly well. It's just basically wording on it that needs to be revised, I think. Yeah, hi. Um, at this time, I don't have any additional comments based on what's been said already, so I'll pass. Hi, Laura Smith. Um, I'll focus just on the vision. I'm assuming that's what we're doing here. I think it's real important to have quality of life being very important somewhere mentioned in here because everything I hear, a lot of the people that moved here moved here because of the type and the style and the quality of life. So I think that's an important issue. Um, I, I tend to agree with Jim. I kind of like the statement the way it is, but although Dorothy made a good point on the word excellent, I mean, there's a couple of words in here that we probably should probably more more visual or quantif quantifiable what we mean by the word. Um, excellent is uh, ambiguous. Yes. Something that I see we're missing is um, our community, um, people do come here to retire, but they're not giving up on their lives since that's, we've become a real action-oriented recreational area with all the different sports, paddle boards and um, everything bikes, skates, scooters, and uh, I think action sports related would be something t that needs to be passed on. Great. Well, um, I think what we'll do in all of these sections is when we when we bring back the, the document to you guys, we'll, we'll make some of the refinements, obviously taking into account some of the other comments we've had, and, and um, we'll keep refining it from there. So. Um, I think just for the sake of trying to get through all the sections, we'll keep moving and we'll move on to land use and growth management. So probably the best way to track along, um, does everybody have um, a hard copy of the assessment with them? Okay, we've got worksheets then. So we'll, um, why don't you go ahead and talk about the summary and I'll get the worksheets. All right, so the worksheets that Darcy is gonna be bringing you are the printed version of the online survey. So you'll be able to go back and weigh in on the online survey, tell your friends to do the same, uh, but the printed version might be a little bit more readable. So some of the comments that we've received on the land use and growth management uh, issues, let's see, so specifically, there is some concern about an equal allocation of funds across the city in all the neighborhoods. Uh, specifically regarding infrastructure, things like pedestrian improvements, uh, and how that should be referenced, if at all, and how that should be addressed in an action plan, if at all. Um, revitalization of vacant industrial and commercial areas in the north of the city was also brought up. Um, again, that's a question of how do we want to address that? Should it be addressed in the plan, and to what extent? Um, there was a member 
of the uh, community meetings that came in and mentioned an agreement with the Bureau of Land Management that should probably be added to the plan. It's about a three-year-old agreement regarding public land and the use of public land. So that is definitely something that we will look more into and we will get more information and share that with you about that agreement. Um, there are significant compatibility concerns with the expanding population, uh, specifically regarding recreational facilities adjacent to um, housing. And it's kind of a twofold uh, concern that was brought up. The first concern being that they're easily accessible and very close by. And the second concern being with the type of recreational facilities and what noise or lighting pollution is a result of those recreational facilities. Um, which of course brings in the boat noise and the lighting pollution, which was uh, mentioned a few times. Uh, there was also some concern for cell tower screening uh, and other utility screening. And specifically in dealing with downtown and commercial properties, there was concern for uh, either planning increased density in the core neighborhoods or in general calling out areas that increased density in terms of housing or commercial development could be accepted by the community. Uh, there was also some concern about improving the gateway to the city and so that would be the entrances to the city off of frontage roads and highways uh, and improving that transition and making it more of a, a place. I would add just one other thing I had a conversation with some folks about is, you know, that perhaps it would be helpful in the general plan to have um, area specific policies. So we may want to have some specific policies and they're kind of all melded together right now. But to clearly call out, you know, the um, the island area, um, McCulloch Avenue, um, the different areas where you have kind of different needs. So that, that's just kind of a, a more of a structural uh, kind of issue, but something I wanted to mention. So why don't we go ahead and um, do another round here? I think that worked pretty well. Thank you, sir. And see what you guys think about the land use policies then. Well, a good many of the decisions that we make about land use are directly related to either state lands or BLM. And um, so I think that our, um, our work with those two agencies is very important and ought to continue. This is probably more my personal opinion than the senior center, but the property that is Body Beach, where they want to continue and go up that way, I think, I don't know just what has to be done to acquire that property, but I think that should be one of the um, primary pieces of land the city tries to get. I'm going to pass at this time. Um, in terms of community character and design, in the last meeting we just had, we had a really good discussion over it, I think, where it was highlighted that Lake Havasu is made of people who are individuals and really don't want to be told what color to paint their house or their gravel or things like that because we're so unique and we already have such a build out situation to change that now would be difficult. But there was large agreement that our entrances and the entire highway corridor that starts at McCulloch and ends at the mall really needs to be cohesive, finished, professional, and really looking good and, and there are some areas that are good examples of what needs to be finished but there's others that are just big gaping holes of nothing and it, it, we felt that, that would be a good way to have the tourism corridor so to speak really highlighted to say hey we mean business this is the way we want to be seen and the other people the other 80 percent of the property can do what they want but we felt that like you said st highlighting specific zones in a structural manner might really help us focus where those monies need to go. And I'll just add one other thing actually that came out of the conversation with you at the last meeting was related to the future land use plan map. Um, and I thought it was a great point about, you know, making sure that the, the land use and the transportation pieces are integrated so people can really get a feel for where the future growth of the city will go. Um, you know, no, knowing that a lot of it will be infill, but that there could be potential expansion if the land use uh, or the ownership issues are, are 
uh, resolved at some point. So just sort of making sure that that's, that's captured in terms of an overall vision. So. Okay, one thing I kind of, uh, when I read over it, didn't, uh, I thought really probably needed to be addressed as far as residential expansion. There's really no wording on where we're going to go as the population increases. Uh, right now, land usage is uh, really at a minimal. I, to be to be fair, I don't know where you know where it's going to be expanded at that at this point. Also, um, another another issue would probably be something to be addressed as far as um, the residential corridor coming into the city. Right now. Yeah, I guess signage is an issue. Uh, that's a cheap way of looking at it, but the bottom line is if I were driving to the city and coming in from uh, the highway, um, it looks rather poor. There's garbage all over everything else all the time. It's overgrown on, uh, on the uh, city uh, sidewalks until you get further into the city where it's more landscaped and everything. Those are just two issues there. Yeah, my name's Dan Kais. I'm, I'm new. I'm the Recreation Aquatics Manager here for the city. And uh, so I'm absorbing a lot of information, particularly as we go through this general planning, uh, this general planning uh, process. Uh, obviously, a, a lot of my interests are in, in park use and in public lands. And uh, one of the things I have to say is that um, compared to other um, compared to other agencies that I worked for, other communities I've been, you've done really. We have to look at the past. We've done an excellent job at preserving your your shoreline. You don't have industrial right up next to it. You don't have a lot of housing right up next to it. You've preserved all of that because I've been in a lot of communities where that mistake has been made already, and it's hard to get that area back. And so the only thing I can say is is based on that because it provides us such a a great template for further uh, public development uh, for especially for leisure services is that that uh, uh, as the development uh, as the code update for the development plan is that you know the recommendation of the city continue to encourage active or passive park trail or conservation uses on those public lands is, is right on target uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm really excited about where you are uh, where we are uh, and uh, and the fact that you that you realize that you want to continue down that that road is is essential, and uh, you should feel really good about about that at this point. Wow, um, the overview part, and I'm not sure if this is an appropriate place to put it in. When I first got involved, which is probably what about 10 years ago, and was asking questions on how everything worked, where does the general plan fit, where does the development code fit, what what are you supposed to follow, basically? I was told the general plan was basically your Bible. It tells you how the voter, you know, the voters vote to approve this. So it's the 10 year plan of how the people in the city want their city to develop. Then, when I got a good understanding of the general plan from a good teacher, that they're probably saying, Why did you teach her at this point? <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> Um, and I got a handle on the development plan, then I was told, well, no, wait, you know, you, you're misunderstanding. The general plan is general. It's only a guide. You got to get down into the development code, and that is now basically your Bible. Okay. <laughs> well, now it's to the point, if you look at the 2002, and I have both of them, what the voters approved in 2002, what it is now because it was revised in 2008, Huge difference. They have gutted it. What the voters expect, what the voters think our vision is. Vision may say what it is, but what reality is, it has totally changed. They wanted wide open views. Those are pretty much because of changes that they're not seeing yet. And I believe the majority of the public has no clue the changes that were implemented because none of the buildings taking place because one the economy and I have other reasons I think but anyway a lot of it got changed to the mixed use and for instance I will use the sensitive areas of the lake somewhere in our general plan and I can find it it states our lake should be protected 
mountain views shall be protected, and those become very important words. <laughs> the newest thing for our view corridors is no longer that from your house you go out, you can see the lake. Currently you still can because there's no buildings down there. And it was limited to 25 feet all around the lake. Due to how, from my perspective, the code was manipulated, now they can have 90-foot buildings over McCulloch down by the lake. The view corridors are that you can't have a straight building all the way across, but you have to make sure there's a section that you can see through. Well, that completely changes your whole view. It completely changes what the public's perception was. Not only that, it's no longer limited to commercial, where this was your commercial area that you would go to tourism area with hotels. It is now mixed use with a 20% commercial element required. 80% can now be residential. All of the studies, all of the surveys showed people didn't want condos down by the lake. People wanted it commercial. Now granted, financially, get a developer in, that was the problem. People didn't want to put all this money just in commercial. They wanted the immediate payback. They wanted to sell condos, get the money to invest and to build their project. So where do you find that compromise? From my perspective, the people were completely compromised because we basically lost all of our protections of the general plan. And I say that being the major amendment that was changed. And I don't know, is this the proper time to bring that up specifically? Okay. Major amendment used to say, <laughs> Any project not in compliance with the general plan policies will trigger a major amendment. Well, that's almost everything. Major amendment requires two-thirds vote of city council as stated by state law. That went away. Now it's strictly if it's five or more acres of land that you're trying to get a land use change, that triggers major amendment. Well, staff can tell you, there is very few properties out there that are five acres and under 40, because there is a, another click at 40 acres. So between five and 40, how many properties are we talking about? There's not very many. So everything basically in any changes made are gonna be considered minor, simple majority vote at council. So now you have taken a voter approved document, said we're holding to what the voters want, but a simple majority, four people on council can now change it. I don't think that's right. Um, they say outside the platted area, 40 acres or more without a specific plan triggers it. Our development code requires if you have 40 acres or more, you have to have a specific plan. So that's pretty much immaterial. Um, so anyway, I think that's really important. If we're really gonna do a general plan that's voter approved and what the people want, it shouldn't be real easy to change. There should be something in there and it may be not as you know, I agree maybe any change triggering it because you can only have them once a year. That may be a little strict, but to have it right now the way it is where everything's minor, that isn't right for the people either. Well, thank you, I've got to follow that. Um, well put, by the way. Um, so I'm gonna go in a different direction. Um, First, let me ask a question. Uh, these documents that she has, are they available? The, uh, the older plans? Um, Stu, do you, the original 2002 version? And then, and the 2008. It, are they available electronically? Yeah, I, I would appreciate that. Um, yeah, okay, so my comment is, um, you know, there were, there were a lot of uh, comments made about where's the growth going to be, uh, trying to define that, the impact of the growth uh, that it's going to have on our uh, community. And there's a lot of tactical issues um, that are very relevant and will impact every one of us as, as uh, residents. The thing that concerns me is uh, 
we, we you have a, a, a broad spectrum of issues and um, things that have to be addressed. And I understand the importance of each one. But I think we need to define the driver of economic growth. So if we define the driver, it's going to dictate um, to some degree where the impact will be, how the impact is going to be felt, the, the uh, resources we'll need to f foster that growth. Um, so I just think that at a higher level, we should define a driver. And uh, it just, just as a cursory uh, uh, look at this, uh, the, the discussing economic development and where that's going to go and defining what that really is might help us drive towards these other issues. I got it. Um, I'm going to go off a little bit different. And I'm going to agree with Jim on the, what the, it looks like on the corridor coming in. Um, the one difficulty that we have with um, that area is it's controlled by ADOT. They put a nice trail from South McCulloch to North Palo Verde, but they only really beautified from Smoke Tree to North Palo Verde. And that is a, a, a nice area when people come in. Because if you do go to another community or Phoenix or anywhere else, all those nice underpasses and overpasses, but the, of course they're controlled by ADOT. And we need to get a better relationship to where we can do those things uh, for shared use that we can do it. Um, like we're running into an instance for the uh, aquatic center. We have a, a marquee right now that's the poor little ducky is fading, but he's right in the uh, area where um, ADOT, we have to get some kind of approval from them in order to put another marquee out there. So what we need to deal, and the thing is the, the trails are nice, but they're not as beautiful as they could be, and they could be expanded because we do talk about people riding to Sarah Park, and they ride to Parker and Havasu Springs, and we've had a few fatalities and some injuries, and we need some kind of bike path, and the same thing going out towards the north side, towards the airport. So trails are very, very important, and that's one of the things that uh, I think we should control or help to uh, talk with uh, ADOT about. But I know jurisdictions are difficult to deal with because we have the same instance with noises uh, on the, the lake or shared use for docks and uh, uh, property on the lake. So we have to get a better relationship, I think, with all the shared uses. Because, I mean, our jurisdiction also on the lake, I don't know, how many jurisdictions do we have? Uh, 19 jurisdictions on the lake. So that's a real difficult thing that we have to control. Just want to join in for a minute there. Uh, this business of uh, when you're looking at land use and growth management, uh, I think it would be a serious mistake to encourage large-scale residential development where this type of thing where all the houses look alike. Uh, I've talked with a lot of people that really feel that it's an asset to Lake Havasu City that the houses are all different. That That is not like when you go to Las Vegas and you see these huge areas in Las Vegas where they're all identical houses and it just looks unfriendly uh, and a leave me alone type community. So I, I would not like to see that happen. Chime in on the land use and growth management policies. Well, I already did. Oh, sorry, I was thinking we. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the question is: uh, is are there other issues um, that anyone wants to raise on that topic, or the land use map? Mm -hmm. I know it's the MCC site, and I'm not sure what you're. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to it as, because in all of the list of the parks somewhere in that document, I don't recall where it is exactly, I didn't see it listed. 
and on the land use, the color is gray. And I'm thinking as with Sarah Park, because it is a BLM patent, it should be state was green, what color was BLM? I forget the colors, but shouldn't that color be to show that it is a BLM patent? I think there are some some just technical updates to okay. the map that need to be made. So yeah, what's reflected in your packet now is what it shows us currently. So we okay. will be making some of those technical updates. We have a big version at the back. So if there are things like okay. that that we want to find before okay. you guys go, yeah, we can do that, that was. So, yep. That's great. Um, I think Laura brought up a really good point about the structural problem of, appl of application of the general plan versus the development code. And I just looked down and realized it's already 1215, but this is a really big problem because we're in the trenches in the Planning Commission, the Board of Adjustments, the development community, those kind of things. And what, what she talked about when the amendments were made and the five acre change specifically, that wasn't done I mean, I was there, you were there. I don't feel that that was done to as a big fat gift to the development community. Oh, don't worry until you hit five acres. I think what happened was we recognized that there was this huge stumbling block in the shalls of the general plan that said you shall do this annual amendment or you can't do anything. For example, if you wanted to do a one half acre commercial remodel, or I'm sorry, a rezone, well, the, the general plan doesn't support that. Well, you got to wait till the whole year comes around before you can even apply to get that change done. And if that was successful after four months, then you can apply for your zone change in another two months. And I think that the, the intent of that change to five acre minimum was to reduce that year and a half cycle of non-availability of doing anything. It was really stifling. And the, the, but you bring up the point of structural application of the use of our code and our general plan there were some things in there that were just so difficult to get anything done it wasn't a smarter legislation or smarter growth it was like no growth and that was that was tough I, I would hope that we could find a way to loosen some of those to say hey this is a guiding document it's a goal document it's it's a small map with big markers but sometimes we can't find where that line is where you know where where is the line here is it this street is it this block and that's that's been a difficult thing on the planning commission for a, a many years but I, I would hope we could refine that somehow. Any last comments on land use before we move on? Okay. Um, why don't we go ahead and jump into our next topic, which I believe is... Um, next topic is housing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I will say that the land use and growth management concerns were a monster and all of these other ones are much shorter. So take solace in that. Um, for housing, we heard several concerns about homelessness and how that could be addressed in the plan, if it should be addressed in the plan, and what exactly needs to be said about it. Um, there's also concerns with workforce housing, transitional housing. So that would be things like rehabilitation centers, uh, that type of um, structure. And also the question of what is a complete neighborhood and is that what we want to include? And is that something that we should specifically reference? Um, to expand upon that, uh, the idea of complete neighborhoods are neighborhoods which offer a full range of living amenities within a walkable or a short driving distance. Um, so it's the idea that where you live, you could easily access a grocery store, easily access medical centers, um, the basic needs of what you need to survive in your community. Um, and so that's a question of whether or not we want to include that reference in the plan. Uh, and if we feel that that plan or that uh, reference and the idea of a complete neighborhood is something that Lake Havasu would like to expand upon. Um, I grew up here. I've seen it grow. I feel like our neighborhood is about 40 square miles. I don't live in New York City. I have a car. Uh, I have a bicycle. But I know that there's a lot of people in urban environments that live in a neighborhood. They, they walk to the subway. They go to their job. They walk to the grocery store. They are a neighborhood in its flavor. I, I just don't subscribe to the urban 
ideal of compressing people into small areas. And, and I think what Don just mentioned about the conglomeration of like homes as a neighborhood is something this town really doesn't want. Most of our houses are very unique all over, they're spread all out. And I don't like the compartmentalization of these neighborhoods. We have that now. Oh, you live on the golf course. Oh, you live up in this, or, oh, you live over there. Oh, you live next to this school, that school. And I think that's an us versus them mentality that creeps in instead of a community of the city that's only 50 years old and has its own unique flavor. Uh, is this necessary? Yeah. All right. I apologize for the tardiness. Uh, those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Eigenbrod. I'm the president uh, CEO of Interagency Council. Uh, we, uh, among I'm sure others, but we have a transition house in town and a woman's domestic violence shelter. We have a property that was donated to us that uh, was 7,000 square feet with the idea of being a woman's shelter that we cannot have as a woman's shelter because we can't get the zoning for it at this point. Um, even if uh, we could, you can't have a public hearing uh, uh, or talking about where a woman's, thank you, do I exist? Uh, uh, woman's domestic violence shelter is. Uh, I, uh, and in the eyes of Maripima, uh, Maricopa and Pima, we're kind of, uh, we're, not, we're not rural anymore. We are over 50,000 people. But when I think, and I've had this discussion at their statewide town halls, when they talk about this, I think they're thinking that when you have 50,000 people, you have a suburb right next door with 20,000 people, and you have another suburb with 15,000 people. No, we're 50,000 people with, with 55 miles of desert and with a lake that you can't swim across unless you're in really good shape. And so the services that we have in Lake Havasu are the services that are here. We're not relying on another community to, to help provide those services. So although in some people's eyes, uh, no longer rural, uh, we are decidedly rural when it comes to that we have to be self-contained. And um, I think that there is a great need to address uh, homelessness. Uh, we've we've had people expire this year due to exposure, uh, and uh, there are communities that are working on this right now. I'm the chair of the committee in Bullhead that works with uh, Laughlin and Bullhead and Fort Mojave uh, dealing with this very issue, and they're working on a consortium of churches uh, where the uh, it's kind of a neat program. It's a program that's being run in Valparaiso, Indiana, and Tucson where uh, uh, people are able to stay overnight in church one night, men in one, women and women and children in another, and then it, it rotates. I think they have 28 churches that are in, in that, and then they have a day center, uh, which uh, we're looking at opening as well, where people can come in and have intake and then classes. Uh, the other thing that, I don't know if this fits in what you've been talking about before I got here, but we have a lot of tremendous partners in Lake Havasu City. Uh, I didn't see a whole lot. I did read through the percent. I didn't see a whole lot mentioned about the social services that are in this town, but they are tremendous. Uh, if you and you start naming them, you're going to screw up. But um, uh, and they're working as partners a lot more than people might think. From the food banks to the mental health facilities, uh, they realize that uh, we could have ten women shelters, unfortunately, and they'd probably all be full. Uh, and there's not enough counselors. They, they know that. And so there's no Hatfield and McCoy, or there isn't as much Hatfield and McCoy. Uh, so I really do believe that that's uh, something that really needs to be addressed. Okay? More than you wanted to hear, right? No, that's good. Well, I think that... Um, that the housing element here under um, under housing and neighborhoods addresses a couple of different things and they seem to me to be kind of at odds because we're talking about, in one instance, we're talking about housing for everybody and uh, everywhere. 
so we don't have uh, a segregated population town, whatever. But then we say, well, these things have to be located, these, some of these elements and some of these folks have to be located near certain, for certain amenities, transportation and whatever. Well, the way Havis is laid out, most of those amenities are around the core. And uh, so we don't have good transportation, for example, to the outlying neighborhoods. Uh, to, uh, to expand on, uh, on Mike's comments about the 7,000 foot uh, facility and the resistance of the neighborhood to that facility and, and its use, um, I think there I think there ought to be neighborhoods where the people that live there c have certain expectations about how they want to live and where they want to live and what they want to have next door to them and uh, and we we haven't really solved that problem yet and uh, but we're working on it so I think we ought to continue to do that. I have to agree with with Mike, and I don't think we've met Mike. Um, but we do have a real problem with homelessness here in town. People are unaware of it. I've seen it firsthand, and it has to do with shared use properties. A lot of the state lands, state parks, there's communities out there that we don't and don't see. Um, another thing is, yes, we are a rural area, and I can tell you firsthand, I've had some medical issues because of we're not considered a rural area, you have to either go to Phoenix or you have to go to Vegas. So we have to kind of address those things. But um, it really concerns me that, that we do have a lot of homeless people in our community and that needs to be addressed. So, And I think we need more dog parks. No, just kidding. I'm just gonna simply reiterate some of the things that have already been said. Um, I think Mike did articulate the uh, the fact that we're we've hit our fifty thousand uh, residential threshold. Uh, that doesn't necessarily classify us as an urban environment, and uh, for all the reasons he just mentioned, um, homelessness I agree is something that needs to be addressed in this community. Um, it will continue to uh, get get worse if we don't. Uh, transitional housing is another issue that I think uh, is is important. And the only other last point that I want to make is that, and again, it's just a reiteration of uh, what's already been said, is the uh, uh, utilization of vacant properties. And I realize these are private lots, uh, but whatever we can do to uh, incent the development uh, internally uh, to enhance our residential neighborhoods and minimize the number of vacant lots that we have out there, um, I think it'd be a lot, uh, it would be a major improvement to our city. I agree with a lot of what Jim Leeson had to say about trying to turn Havasu into the complete neighborhood. I don't agree that we want to do, go that route. Oh boy, controversial issues on housing. Student housing, vacation rentals, bed and breakfast, live work, quasi business uses such as were mentioned by Mike. Um, Boy, you got that's the city is totally divided on that issue. And if you do have to bring them up at a zoning level, you guys are going to have fun, <laughs> as you know. The only thing I read in the report is it identifies bed and breakfast in there. I didn't really see anything that relates to student housing, vacation rentals, although we have a lot of them, they really aren't allowed by code. Any short term rentals. You're not allowed, so by rights, they're in violation, but how do you enforce it? How do you prove that, oh, it was a weekend stay? I mean, that would be a nightmare for staff. <laughs> so even if we develop some type of a code, I'm not really sure, you know, opening that can of worms. We, we need to do something because as ASU grows and if it does get bigger, you're going to have student housing wanting to be built. You're going to have the huge homes rented by students, which right now there is some clause in our development code, and I can't quote it off the top of my head, that doesn't allow for a bunch of students to rent a home. And I believe it's the no boarding, it's limited, you can't rent more than two rooms. 
Well, unless you're a sober home or one of the protected classes and you can print out a piece of paper and say, oh, I'm a protected class, we need to fix that too, but I'm going kind of overboard. Um, I'm not really sure. The problem we have with things like sober homes, things like vacation rentals, things like uh, women's centers, where do you put them? And right now, based on the way Havasu developed, your bigger homes, which are in your very low density, or your A1, your RE, your RA areas, that's where they're going to want them because they can buy one huge home and, and make it work. The problem is the people that bought in these areas bought in these areas because they want minimal impact to their neighborhood. So they don't really want a business coming in, which is how it's viewed completely impacting their low density residential area. So I'm not really sure where you meld these two right now. I believe the type of uses mentioned would be in the R3 and R4 areas. They'd be allowed, which is your multi-residential apartment buildings and such. So does it need to be addressed? I think so. I'm not really sure what the answer is because that can totally change the quality of life in our neighborhoods if we start allowing them anywhere. The live work, which is the mixed use, the city seemed to really over from 2008, I think is when it started. That's utilized everywhere pretty much now. We have all those PD subdistricts. I think too, too much of a degree. And my question to you guys is what formula is utilized for all of these mixed use areas to decide for water? and some of the figures in your trends. <laughs> because if we have all these mixed use that do materialize, we're gonna run out of water before you can develop the other areas. Because your mixed use are huge and they're gonna be big water users. So I guess that's all I have right now. Thanks, Laura. And a couple things just to close the loop on the, I mean, a lot of those really are development code issues and something that the code folks are, that, you know, there's some legal issues there that we need to be aware of in terms of locations and all that. And that's something that they are focused on. There's been a lot of discussion on that. So I just wanted to close the loop on that. Yeah, I don't have a lot more to say about this. Uh, I can say that uh, there are some verbiage on uh, B, uh, Looks like B1-1 that refers to having residents having uh, accessibility to all services, including uh, including open space, uh, and I think that's great. I don't I don't really again I don't understand what it takes to to have large developments you know create open space here. Uh, when I was in Montana, they had actually had a uh, they had a, a a park development program where you brought in you know the type of uh, housing. Uh, uh, the type of housing development you're required to provide so much open space and the park board looked at it and said you know what uh, if we don't need a park here based on the park master plan then then money was given in lieu for for park development later on down the road so I, it looks like it's good here uh, but I don't exactly know how all the details work to make parks happen exactly uh, I can say though that it seems to me that uh, that with the trails master plan because i see a lot in here that well the connectability is missing in certain parts of the city and i think that's so important um that uh, that possibly when development comes in that the verbiage agrees i can't find it that development is required to put in uh, trails on on where uh, planned trail systems are uh, and where the extension of those trails would be and uh, to put the onus of that on 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 uh, on development i think would, would behoove the city as well as development it makes their projects a, a lot more attractive when you do that when you have uh trails that that you get from one place to another you've got great open space you know that just sells uh and i, I think that sometimes in a community especially if it's coming out of a, a recession like this one has you know that that makes it harder but in the in the long run it is better it's better for everybody uh so i would just say that Again, it looks like we make an attempt to, to get the uh, to get the uh, open space provisions met, but I'm not sure that it addresses the the trail development because that seems to be a real stickler. Okay, the only real issues I had was uh, really doesn't address like the general plan apartment complexes, um, and I know a lot of people 
that it, it, that it happens to be an issue is where you've got, you know, a $400,000 home or a group of $400,000 homes, and all of a sudden they come in and they turn around and it goes commercial use. You know, so 50 feet from the backyard, you know, you've got commercial use in, in there. Uh, other things that are, and that's getting probably off of the general plan, but uh, the mixed use usage statement, that's a general statement. I think it, and it can be used for the good and evil of the city. I think that needs to be um, addressed. And there should be buffers between businesses and small businesses and residential areas uh, really doesn't make, uh, the general plan doesn't make comments really about that. I think there's getting to be too many ma and pa kettle businesses that are opening in residential areas. Um, also again, once again with residential areas, uh, the sit we're having a tendency to put group homes in residential areas. If you've got a, a $2 million home and you've got a alcohol or drug rehab program that's coming into existence, I mean, it people just don't want that in neighborhoods. It needs to be addressed, you know, you need a business section, you need uh, different sections for these type of, of, uh, of uh, programs to go in. You just can't mix them with the general public. <coughs> I guess I'd like to hear a discussion before I jump in. But uh, the uh, uh, the previous uh, comments I made regard when we were talking land use and growth was referring to the third of the um, statutory elements that were given. And now looking at the statutory elements on this one, uh, I would address the second one there where we're talking about neighborhood stability. Um, the way it is written here with appropriate transitions, meaning buffers between established residential neighborhoods and commercial redevelopment, I feel is very important. And uh, I so stated at the last planning and zoning meeting uh, I do not feel, I think we need a, appropriate buffers in between the, some of the zoning. Last comments on housing and we'll keep moving. Okay. Um, I'm agreeing with Dan. Um, our trails would do need, we need better trails. Unfortunately, again, we're with shared use with state parks. If we go on state park property riding our bikes, we've got to pay the admission fee. And that's, that's an issue that we need to do and work with. As far as the sober living homes, um, other communities, Oregon and Seattle, those, those things are important. And I don't know how we're going to address that. These, they work in, in larger communities. And I've seen them firsthand. Uh, large homes, people need a chance to work this off. It's not like they're, they're, they need a second chance and they're trying to do what they can to get sober and try and make it work. But if we don't have somewhere for those people to go, they're just going to go downhill. But I don't know how we address it because, like we said, the larger homes are in more affluent areas. If we put them in another specific area, that loses their anonymity. And that's something that they also need to work with. They need to work with it to be anonymous and try and work themselves into a better position. position. So I, I think that needs to be addressed. All right, why don't we keep rolling here? Uh, oh, one more. Sorry, Mike. Um, I am not an advocate of large properties being used for shelters. Uh, the woman shelter that we have in Lake Havasu is actually a small home and a lot of people have no clue where it is and that's just fine. Uh, to my knowledge, there's never been a complaint 
and it's been there for more than a decade. It's right in a neighborhood. Uh, behavioral health licensing and other kinds of things step into play where if you have a very large property, you're gonna have to have full service uh, uh, nurses and doctors and all kinds of different things on place that uh, on site that really end up being cost prohibitive to what the Department of Economic Security is helping fund. So I'm I'm not an advocate. It's just just if somebody comes and offers a property like that, I'm going to go. Oh, you bet, <laughs> and and say thank you very much. Uh, but um, uh, we do uh, part of the uh, rehabilitation, if you want to use that word, uh, with the, the sober properties, which we're not running, but we've got three different groups asking us to. Uh, and the uh, uh, there's another one, by the way. Years ago, used call some uh, call them orphanages. There is, there is not one in Mojave County. There is a harbor house up in Kingman that has l a very limited number of beds and they do the best they can. But uh, right now kids are being sent uh, to uh, uh, Maricopa and uh, Flag and Prescott and often split up because there's not enough foster parents. And I really mean that. I mean, it's, uh, it's tough. And so, uh, and you can't just have one property, a large property for all, you can't have, teenage boys in the same property with teenage girls. So uh, it needs to be separated. Uh, I really believe we need something like that here. We need it in this county, but we need it here. And again, I uh, part of the rehabilitation, and I agree, with, uh, it's Mark, is, um, uh, and it's not me saying, it's, it's all these studies, that you really need to be in more or less a residential setting to, to to put a woman shelter in an industrial park probably isn't going to isn't going to really isn't going to work. And uh, finally, um, we do have a women's shelter in town. It's maxed. It has been maxed out for a number of years. There is no men's shelter. Uh, there was a gentleman that uh, passed due to exposure in Havasu not too long ago. There was another one in uh, Bullhead, and I believe it was the one in Bullhead was a family. There was a place for the women and children, and not for the the the, the man. And he didn't make it. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's another area we need to look at. Thank you. All right, I think we're diving into economy, right? Okay, yeah. So thank you very much for that. That was really, really good information. Um, we're going to dive into economy now. Again, it's a pretty short list. Uh, specifically, there's concerns about development on the island and what could or would be allowed. Marina launch expansion, a more of a focus on Arizona State University, again, either expanded classes, expanded campus, and the jobs that come along with that. Uh, expanded workforce training, and a more pedestrian-friendly downtown, so that maybe you know the shops might have more of a uh, chance to get pedestrian commerce as people walk around and filter in and out of shops. So what side would like to start responding? Okay. I'm just going to pass on it right now. Yeah, I don't have anything to add at this time. Wow. I, I'm not sure if the step that I have really falls into the economic. I think it seems because of the economy, we react, our city reacts, instead of having the general plan guiding how we're going to build. And I'll use an example that now has turned into a problem issue, which is that motorhome or RV place out near the airport. That was supposed to be all industrial. If you looked at the general plan, industrial area. People that own the land came in for a general plan amendment. Reactionary, because we didn't have a lot of development at the time, it got approved to change it to allow for these units. They weren't going to be sold to the public, although most of us felt that would probably happen. So now you have a huge residential, I guess you'd call it a residential development because you have hundreds of people out there. It's very nice development, but there are now issues because some of the industrial uses or where you would put your louder uses, such as the racetrack that's been coming up, they don't want it there. So I guess my question is, how do we address, and I don't know where you address it, 
to where we're not just every council's reacting. Because if it's, this is supposed to be a 10-year plan and how we want our city to grow, but every time you have a council come in, a land use becomes political, then it's going to be based on a four-year. And it's going to be, wow, we need the money, we need the taxes, let's go ahead and change land use, change zoning, let them build it regardless of the future implications. And I guess I'm kind of looking more long-term at how our city's going to be at build out versus looking at, Oh, well, you know, that one development commercial, it, it's going to bring in some money, and it's okay. Those people aren't going to be that affected by it. Let's go ahead and approve it. Well, if <laughs> there should be a really valid reason to doing the changes. It shouldn't just all be based on economic factors. And I don't know where joint, joint parking falls in, if that's another economic or... If, well, but they address it in the general, in the, the literature you guys have, and they're basically saying that they want to promote it. So if that's in your general plan and that's your guiding, are we then, that will be used to say, oh, we need more parking in common. And parking in common, we've got a lot of issues there too. It works great until you have a high intensity use such as a restaurant build in that area. Then all the people, you don't have enough parking for the businesses that are there. So I don't want economy driving our land use and I feel that that's what's happened. Uh, a couple comments. The um, mentioning of the uh, in your preamble there about the uh, the channel, uh, another boat launch. Uh, boating does uh, d drive a lot of our economy, um, and we rely heavily during the uh, boating seasons. And it is a frustration with boaters that we don't have enough facilities to to launch. And uh, if you've ever been on the island uh, during some peak periods, uh, the uh, launch line is going around the island. Um, so I do agree with that. I think that we need to address the uh, the, the lake or the channel in, in more specifically. The channel basically is our liquid main street, and it um, needs to be uh, some area focus uh, relative to its development, its beach enhancement, uh, and, and enhancing the tourism appeal um, that, that that we that we live upon right now. Um, and you also mentioned. Uh, Arizona State University, and in, in the uh, document here, the, um, you know, I agree with, you know, the, the area, the impacted area around Lake um, ASU is an area that we need to focus on, and I do think that uh, it, now and in the future, you're going to see a need for development in that, that specific area. Uh, we'll call it the college district, if you will. Um, what you did, you also mentioned the, uh, you know, in, in mentioning in the general plan, the uh, expanding of their curriculum, the uh, student housing, whatever it might be. And, I, and I'm not talking about student housing from a, uh, uh, a zoning standpoint or, or that type of thing. I'm talking about Lake Havis, um, a ASU actually building a, uh, um, a facility on their own, on their property. Um, the development of the curriculum, I don't think the city has any input in that, although the city can partner with ASU to develop research uh, opportunities that would that would benefit the city and ASU. So those types of things, I think uh, maybe we can make a recommendation in the general plan to that effect. Um, that's that's all I have. Well, a couple of comments. Um, it would probably be very nice from a planning perspective if everything were stable, but it's not. And economic opportunities come out of, seemingly sometimes they come out of nowhere. And you have to address those, and, to, and it's not an easy thing to do, to balance the, what we intended to do five or six years ago and where we are now. So. It's always going to be a balancing act. The, um, as far as ASU and their future plans, I think that there have been uh, quite a bit of, of uh, interaction between ASU and various elements of the city. And uh, one of the things that's, that's happened recently is the, the addition of the, of the, the lake and the environmental um, things that are happening over there. And so, uh, 
and that was, I think, as a result of, of input from from the city and ASU. They needed something to do. We said, well, why don't you do this? And they said, oh, that seems like a good idea. So anyway, I think, you know, we do the best we can with what we have. And uh, so I think those issues will come up and we'll resolve them one way or another. Maybe not to your satisfaction, Laura. <laughs> On the um, <clears throat> McCullough Boulevard, they have a couple different items here that refer to McCullough Boulevard. And uh, I live on Mesquite, just right around the corner from McCullough Boulevard. And I know they have a new parking lot there now at the uh, a coma end of it and you never see anyone parked in that parking lot now but when they have activities on a coma uh, over on McCullough and especially I think the most populated one of people going there is Desert Storm and when they had Desert Storm we couldn't even get out of our driveway <laughs> To, because they were parked on both sides of the street, the traffic, everything was routed around that way. But I have talked to different people that I know that have businesses along McCullough, and I agree with them, is we want as many activities going on on McCullough Boulevard as we can possibly have, because it's a big draw for the city. And with the one parking lot that they've built up by a coma, something is going to have to be done more down by smoke tree because there still is not enough area for parking. I would like to see the city come up with more innovative ideas to help commercial, um, perhaps in partnership with uh, other groups like the Main Street organization. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, Chamber, but I like the term Main Street. Uh, I think it's I think it's friendly. Uh, and um, I would also like to see ways that we can encourage more commercial and industrial to come in as far as jobs. We need more jobs. Uh, yeah, sure, we've got uh, ASU here now, but what do they do when they graduate? Um, we need places for them to go to. I agree with a lot of what's already been said, but I, um, I also see our economy kind of in three different sectors. We have the tourism economy, and you mentioned the launch ramps and the facilities to support that, to get them uh, more amenities. I see the service community, which is all of us, really, our architects, engineers, beauty salons, accountants, people that supply the economy to our own community. And, and I see what I call the jobs community, which is not necessarily industrial, but making stuff. And, and we have a, a lot of, of really interesting businesses in Lake Havasu that you don't even know are here that rely on outside money. And that's intended to be in the business park areas and stuff like that, but they're all over. And UPS is their friend, they don't need a railroad spur, and they're bringing money in from outside and they're very stable. I think we should be able to increase all three of those uh, sectors. And I, I almost wish we could relax some of our standards because how do we predict the next need? If somebody comes in and says, I wanna make widgets in this area, and this is the space I need to do it. I, I wish they had the application ability to do it because when the general plan is too tight, sometimes it's, well, you're not on the map there, so you can't be there. You've got to go over here where the land is 10 times more expensive. I think that's stifling, and I wish there was a way that we could have more ability to ask permission or ask for the process to happen, perhaps a better plan development application or something like that. But, and we've had a lot of zone change questions come up recently where the technologies that, are, and I'll use the example of the, um, the, the jet ski converted thing that looks like a hovercraft. It's a jet pack. 
that's controversial because it's new, but it's not like a jet ski, but people think of it as a personal watercraft. How do we make that fit? Well, this is the section, the economy section of how do we find a way for that to work? And I, I wish we had less restriction to invite that kind of economic boost. Any last comments? Uh, again, I think one of the things that the city is bumping into, and Charlie left so I can say, um, going back to the urban rural thing, uh, I don't know if it's a consortium of, with the chamber and other organizations that work to help educate some of the, uh, uh, the, the larger restaurants and some of the other businesses that might be interested in Havasu when they work with an economic threshold need of a quarter million people and uh, when we've got 50,000 um, and we're, we're upset because XYZ restaurant can't come into town and it turns out they're, they use this formula that uh, would apply very well perhaps in Phoenix uh, but doesn't really apply so well here and uh, if it's an education process that maybe a group of us get together and do uh, in a search committee and try and get these people to come and, and look at us, we are different. There are some situations here that uh, uh, we are standalone and uh, we probably could uh, perhaps uh, make a go of an organization that would normally say, no, we need a much larger, larger economic base uh, than what we really have because people tend to stay here more to shop here because it's 60 miles to go to the nearest next place. Is that, did I say that in English? I tried. Hello, is that, I'm assuming a lot of that's something you guys are already really focused on. Is that yeah. accurate? It is. The, um, you know, everything you said is, is spot on. The, um, the need to, uh, engage the Marriott's of the world and different uh, uh, things assuming you, you want a convention you know center and uh, all the associated amenities that go with that hotels and, and maybe air service uh, because you know you, you have a spot to go to um, all of those things are being addressed in uh, in economic development um, the convention and visitors bureau is heavily involved in that as well um, so yeah in answer to your question a, a lot of that's being addressed uh, there's a uh, consortium, you know, that involves uh, the, the, the chamber, the C CVB, the um, Partners for Economic Development, and the city itself um, to define, you know, what what's important to this city and trying to all work in sync with one another and trying to uh, uh, define economic development and, and what is it that we want to pursue. So, uh, you know, without getting into too much granular detail, the answer to your question is yes, a lot of those things are being addressed. It would be nice to have the general plan updated to reflect a lot of those things, and that's, you know, one of the reasons I'm here. So, thank you. All right, any last comments on that one? All right, for the sake of time, we're gonna move on to circulation. I'm gonna to try to summarize these quickly because there are quite a few. Um, first, regarding bikes. Uh, there's some concern about bikes being on the roads uh, and some preference for separated areas or paths. Um, there's also significant concern for the Acoma bike and traffic conflict. Uh, possibly widening that street or working to incorporate bike lanes or move the bike lanes. Um, mo a lot of concern about sidewalks and pedestrian uh, transportation. There's some concern about signal timing along 95. Also significant concern about roadway lighting. Some conceptual roadway extension should be added to the map, uh, possibly to be more illustrative of what the community would like them to look like in the future. Uh, also, a possible update to the transportation component uh, should be delayed until after the MPO RTP is completed. Uh, since the NPO is just getting started and they will be very much focused on uh, transportation issues, there's 
the idea that perhaps that should be updated after their efforts are completed. Um, the question of whether we would want a complete street in the downtown area or on the main drag, uh, and that ties into pedestrian infrastructure, making it a little nicer for people to be walking around down there, milling in and out of shops, uh, and how you want to do that with crosswalks and curbs and things like that. And the final part would be, again, related to the MPO, uh, revisiting a 1998 study that was completed. Uh, it's something that the MPO will be looking into for possible incorporation. Uh, and that's something that we will definitely look into for more information as well. Mr. Casson's left. I think whoever fixes the lights in Lake Havasu will have a bronze statue made of him down at the bridge. And will and we'll be just the greatest person ever to walk this, this city. And if we just fix that, the whole city will get behind everything in the general plan. That's my only comment. Two things we're talking about here in the, uh, uh, what was handed out. The, uh, uh, regarding the bicycles, um, I think we have to be careful not to overemphasize the bicycle phone. Uh, I drive around town a lot, and if I see one bicycle a week, that's about it. Um, the kids on my block don't ride bikes anymore. They stay home and play on their computer. Uh, the uh, the one bicycle store we used to have in town closed. They didn't have enough business. Um, I, 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 we have some people, y'all, yeah, that they have a few bikes, but it's not a big issue. Um, then, uh, <laughs> oh boy, regarding the public transportation thing, um, I was very, very disappointed in what, what happened. Um, I retired here 25 years ago from AT&T. Uh, soon after I came here, I took a part-time job driving for city transit. Those are all very nice people, those customers. Very nice. Even the teenagers used to say, yes, sir, and no, sir. They were very worthwhile people that we have now neglected. Um, yeah, we're talking about this voucher system. I have a lot of concerns about the voucher system. These people are not trained and scanned. Uh, they're not checked out the way that uh, the transit drivers were. Um, I think we need to really get back to something involving city transit. We're one of the very, very few cities of this size in Arizona that doesn't have one. And I think we're neglecting those people. I don't know if I read through this properly or not, but I thought it said somewhere where when a city reaches over 50,000 people in Arizona, that they needed to have some type of transportation system. I volunteer at the senior center, and a lot of our people cannot drive, so their only way of getting anywhere is on the bus. And we used to have what was called Seniors on the Move, which was associated with HAT. And that has been revamped, and now it's called Havasu Mobility. And the van they use is one dedicated to one of our dear departed members at the Senior Center, Mary Jane. And on the back of the bus, it's got her name. And that's the only 
uh, bus they use for the senior center. I don't know how many people it holds. I really don't know. But four days a week, which is the only days, and it is uh, out of the old hat office, because they're only open four days of the week. They're closed on Friday. And they have five or six drivers, which are all volunteers. And each day, they pick the people up about 10 in the morning, bring them to the senior center, they have lunch, and then they bring them home. And they have another program that, uh, I'm not sure what the um, name of it is, but it's also operated through the same company, but it's paid drivers. And it's the same four days a week, and they operate Monday through Thursday from 9 to 2. And they will bring people to their doctor's appointments. And if they have enough drivers available, they'll bring them shopping. But these people have no way of getting anywhere. And the th other thing that's real sad about losing the transit is uh, the low-income people or people who cannot drive cannot go anywhere and like he said the city is working on a uh, program voucher program but that hasn't been completed yet but for us Lake Havis is not an easy place to get around in but if you don't have even a bus transportation you don't go anywhere Well, this is kind of my wheelhouse, I guess. Um, the city has approached my organization for the voucher program. It does not exist at this moment. There is an agreement between the city and my organization for, which is interagency council, for a voucher system, which would be uh, at least the agreement that I signed, uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, curb to curb service, uh, and um, uh, with uh, uh, a $5 voucher, uh, the city right now, if you look in public notice in the paper, is uh, uh, asking over a four-week period, I believe it is, I wish Charlie were here, uh, for uh, uh, proposals from shuttle services to enter into agreement with the city uh, to provide these services. Uh, so I would wish that it could have happened two months ago. It have been tremendous, but uh, it is the process that they're taking. Uh, I think it's ready to go at that point. As far as um, uh, the voucher system itself, uh, it will be, um, uh, actually, I even have a copy of what a voucher would look like if you'd like. Uh, but it is a photo ID that's issued uh, during the intake, uh, signed by the person that is getting the voucher, signed by a member of staff that has done the intake, and um, the uh, uh, and numbered. And th there was a problem that the city had some years ago with coins, if everybody remembers that, and it kind of became a black market of coins. Right. Uh, that was the last interlude into this, as I recall. Now this would be numbered and where the shuttles would then uh, report back um, uh, bi-monthly on the, uh, the, the card number, not the person's name, but the card number, uh, the day, the trip, and that would then be reconciled with the voucher that's issued. It would be very carefully done. It will be done by the same type of intake that's being done by the food bank, uh, which we're also running. And uh, so uh, what I do know is that that contract has been presented. Uh, it's going in front of city council. And, uh, and the city is right now in the process of getting agreements with the shuttle services. And again, I'd love to see it tomorrow. But I, I'm guessing we're probably three weeks away. Well, I don't think anybody here is a stranger to some of the, some of the arguments, some of the conditions that have and brought up about our bus service. There's been a sea change as far as funding is concerned. And if we're looking at uh, 10 years, 20 years out, I would hope that this situation is much more short-term than that. 
Um, it's evolving. I think people need to be patient and try to understand that that the city can do just so much by itself. And uh, so I, I guess that's all I've got to say about it. Like Mike said, this is in my wheelhouse. When I came back this year from a six month hiatus in May, um, I was looking forward to being able to use HAT. And that's when everything changed. Unfortunately, yes, it's very inconvenient. Four days a week, you have one dispatcher talking to the guys, six drivers. Uh, you have to try and get your appointments two weeks in advance. It's very, very inconvenient. Uh, but I know the city, and talking to the mayor, dean, and a lot of the city council, they understand and they're looking to work for that. Dorothy, the number 50,000 is where our cutoff was in funding. There's no statute that says we have to do it or if somebody mandates from the state that we have to do it. But the city, I know, is trying to work it out with the, the voucher system. And it sounds pretty good to me, but you do have to income qualify in order to do that. And that's what, is now what you're doing, Mike? Okay, that's correct. But there are other people who have jobs that really can't afford it that'll be all able to work also for the voucher program. Right, well, and that's why they've got you involved. So I know the city is working very hard because yes, that does um, make a really big impact on the community for people trying to get to work or get to their doctor's offices. Dawn, you're next. There are five independent bicycle shops in town. And the one bicycle shop I think you're referring to, Psychotherapy, was sold and moved there to their a different property. We also have Kmart, we have Big Five, and we have Walmart that also deal in bicycles. When I talk to some friends of mine who are in the action sports, they don't even think that there's that many bicycle shops in Las Vegas. But we do support these, and these businesses are thriving. Uh, as far as the kids and the bicycles, yeah, we need something on the trail issue of being able to work with the community and work with bicycle trails on the street and other places. Uh, I think everything that's been said is, uh, is appropriate. I, my perception was that we had a bigger bicycle population. I have no data to support that. It's just a personal perception of mine. Uh, so I agree with uh, what he's saying is relative to um, the need for bicycle pass and, and improvement in, in uh, that type of transportation and uh, recreation. I think there should be a focus on the bicycle pass, although I do question there's a big population that uses the longboards, skateboards. Are they allowed on these paths? Because I know like where you have sidewalks, most of it it's you can't be on the sidewalk, so you're supposed to be put over to the road. Um, so I think that's an element that needs to be looked at. Is it just bicycles or are we gonna allow the other mode in there? And I think that's where you do need the balance. I think as you age, am I gonna walk down to one of the grocery stores and carry it back uphill? There is no way, I'm driving. So me using a bike or using the bike personally, there's no way. <laughs> But there is the, po the other side of the population that they may or they will. They probably won't as much in the summer months, but I think it is a need. I think the transportation aspect, that is very important. And hopefully what you mentioned sounds like a doable solution to the problem that we have. So hopefully that works out. But I think that is another primary focus. We need to have some type of transportation system, public, private, whatever, that works for Havasu and is affordable. As your uh, Parks and Rec guy, I really like the language that it has in here about wanting to implement bicycle systems and trails. I think it's great. I think that's that's the trend. I think that especially when we go back, we talk about the neighborhood development. Uh, the well, the new idea, uh, which is really an old idea, is to put mini commercial centers in the middle of the neighborhood so people can get out of their cars, they can ride their bike, they can walk to those places. 
uh, I've heard, uh, I can't remember where, but the, the actual uh, uh, Americans putting miles on their car is actually less uh, this last year than it has been in the last 15 years. So people are getting out of their cars. Uh, and, I, and I think that, uh, and I think that um, uh, there, are, there are communities that I've gone to in the past that I've gone to simply because they had an excellent bicycle transportation system. They were great trails to get on, whether they were urban or rural. And, and, I, and I took my family there because of that. And I, and I think that we can have that here as well. Um, certainly with safety of the kids getting to school um, and uh, whether or not people can get down to the grocery store uh, from their houses, uh, you know, that's, that's important. And whatever you do for bicycles, you're doing for pedestrians as well. So it, it all works. Okay, as far as uh, the bike paths. We definitely need more signage. We need uh, in specific signage. And you need also um, uh, bikes, bicycle throwaways. You need to decide whether you want them on the streets or if you want them strictly on bike paths. Uh, Multi-vehicle usage, you know, motorized skateboards, are we gonna allow them on the paths? Uh, golf carts, I mean, Literally, people drive every form, use every form of transportation on the streets now, which is becoming an issue. You know, we're not looking at small towns. We're looking at 10 to 20 years in advance. Uh, some of your solutions are great for small towns, but they aren't going to work here. Uh, as far as the main drag, I know that McCulloch and the city generally revolves or has in the past around McCulloch Boulevard. But with the expansion group uh, growth and the new malls and everything, I think it should be focused more on where you enter and exit the cities rather than on McCulloch Avenue. Um, again, we're looking at growth. Uh, as far as the public transit system, um, uh, I was very opposed to what happened with the city, what the city did, but I understand it with the with the amount of uh, dollars it had to work with. The voucher system is not an answer when you're looking at 10 to 20 years on a plan. You're looking at a growth rate of approximately 10,000 people. Uh, it just doesn't work. Uh, it works in small towns, but it doesn't work on a large town basis. We need a major, uh, a more public type of transit system like the one we had. Uh, we don't, maybe don't need it with the amount of buses we had, or we could cut the service hours, or we could cut the number of buses we had, or the employment ratios, uh, how many people were, you know, being hired. Uh, if you cut back on all of that, that decrease, you're still, you're, you still have the public transit system in order, and you're not relying on, you know, mom and pa voucher systems. You know, people know that they're going to the buses where they're coming and where they're going to be, and uh, everything else. And with, the, with the work with dealing with elderly, the work status here in town. Uh, you have to remember, there's, it's a 50-50 system. We've got basically a lot of tourists here. We have a lot of growth in that area, but it's also a service area. Most of these people have to be serviced, and that's what it's based on here in the city. Uh, you know, there's a lot of improvement that needs to be done here. We need to attract, not jobs. We need to attract livable wage jobs here that people can live off of, because you're you're uh, the whole city is is be, is growing around these certain individuals when it it really shouldn't be. Uh, we should have, you know, it should be everybody's equal basically I, you know you should be able to make a livable wage here in town and there are more people that do not make a livable wage here in town but so i was really against um and i'm still against uh you know a mom pa shuttle type of system it works great in populations where you 
are 5,000, 10,000. But we're looking at 50, and we're looking at, t with, the, with a development plan, we're looking at 10, 20 years out. And the, and the statistics rise. And yeah, I think everybody has to be aware of that. And think of it, not what's existing now, but what's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years. I think um, we're going to okay. All right, in no way, shape, or form am I suggesting that the proposed shuttle service is a long-term solution. Uh, long-term solution is mass stress, and there's no question about it. We have a situation short-term, and I perhaps echo a little bit of what Dean was saying. We need to deal with now, now and deal with addressing needs as quickly as we can, the best we can. I'm not exactly sure what mom and pa has to do with it, but uh, I really do think as far as the city plan is concerned, we need to look at mass transit, not a shuttle type service. This is just something to get us from here to here. Thank you. Did you have one too, Don? Okay. Just a couple of other words on the city transit thing. I'm I am concerned about the voucher system with the no background checks. Uh, they don't have emergency medical training. They don't have ADA training. Uh, wheelchair accessibility is a, is a concern. Uh, we even used to use hats to get the bicyclists back uphill after they went downhill. But uh, uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, uh, I'm involved in Special Olympics. My wife's in charge of it for the, for the city. And uh, we used to have a contract with the city for public transit to get them to practices. We don't have that now, and we're losing athletes that can't get to practice. Um, just one other thing to let everybody know. Bicycles are handled under the state vehicle code. So, but skateboards and scooters right now, uh, as of a couple of years ago, there was a safety and transportation um, ordinance that was put on for the kids' safety. So just give you a heads up. Okay. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, any last burning issues on any topic that anybody wants to get on the table before we wrap up? Laura says yes. She's got the mic, so. Yeah. Um, a lot of the references made to the various planning documents. Um, I had a question as to why the Swiger report's not included, U of A studies not included. Rudat's not included anywhere. It's there are some things that are referenced in some places and not others. So if we've missed some, it's okay. certainly wasn't I didn't wasn't see those anywhere, and I just wondered yeah. if are they considered outdated? Are we not going to use them? Are we going to figure out where to place those references and links? Sure. Um, Mueller plan wasn't was another one that wasn't in there. And there is a lot of references. I think I saw it in there maybe four or five times to the commercial and health district ordinance. Is there a reason for that? I mean, is that an ordinance that you found to be very good or something a positive about it? or Because that's referenced quite a few times. In well, I think um, it, was, it came up in the, in the actual general plan policies, and I think there's a, there's a link to that. It's, it's not for any particular reason that it's you know, important over anything else other than there is something in place that kind of helps that, I think, was the intent. But... Okay, because that was yeah. a new zoning district again that was created in oh nine maybe I don't know somewhere in there. So, okay, just was curious on that. Thank you. Dorothy's got one more. Okay. I know we didn't get much to the island, and with this being a ten to twenty year planning. I think a new bridge to the island is going to have to be put in there somewhere and probably not too far in the future. And one of the classic examples is just the balloon festival that's coming up in January and the traffic that it's some of the balloon people, I think they had to take their balloons somewhere else and land them and then bring their trucks to pick them up. 
because they were of so much traffic out there. So uh, I think that's going to be one of your big issues in the 10-year planning. And there is a policy in the plan now that talks about a second bridge to the island. I certainly think um, that's also a, a transportation issue. It's a safety issue. There's a variety of things, but probably something the MPO plan will be looking at as well. But I, th I think why don't we go ahead and wrap up? Everybody's everybody's worn out. So um, just before we go, I just wanted to do um, a quick reminder on our next meeting dates. So the next meeting um, for the development code um, is on September 30th. So Don Elliott will be back and Kristen Sazowski to talk about the first module of the development code. So if that's something you're interested in, a lot of the issues. Um, certainly some of the issues we talked about today what time it hasn't been confirmed yet but it'll be on the website as soon as it is so we'll make sure to send um, that information directly to you guys and then we'll be back um, on the general plan yes Dean oh I'm sorry no September 30th uh, that the time for the development code meeting hasn't been confirmed yet so we'll get back to you on that October 30th we will be meeting at the same time with this group and that will be to review a preliminary draft of the plan. Um, so we've got some time to work on that. I think the other plug I would put in there is we got through a lot of the topics today and there was some overlap, I think, between the different sections. But if there's a particular section, you know, we didn't get into open space and recreation, for example, safety, there's a few others. If you really want to take a chance to go through those and send us your comments, on those, you can either send them to um, to Stu and he'll get them on to us, or if it's easier for you to just do the online survey, you can kind of pick and choose your topics. That's fantastic. Um, you know, as much feedback as we can get is is helpful. But this has been a really helpful discussion for us, and um, you know, I think we'll be able to to continue that at our next meeting in October. So, one final question: with your understanding of growing smarter legislation and everything you do, I brought up the question of the general plan and where it falls. Where does it fall? I mean, are we making a guide that is intended to be very flexible and then the development code isn't really mandated to fall? I mean, how flexible is it? Or are we saying, hey, here's our growth. The development code needs to make sure they're in compliance with this. The intent is that your plan is your is your guiding document. It's it's by nature going to be a higher level document, um, but I think the overall intent of the growing growing smarter legislation is that your development code is consistent with your plan. So your point about there being consistency inconsistencies is is always a challenge. I think, but the goal is to definitely that you know your plan needs to have some flexibility, but you also shouldn't be. Um, flat out inconsistent in terms of what your regulations are saying. So that's something we'll kind of work through as we go through this. And um, I think your points um, about the amendment process, um, you know, and, and um, Jim had some comments on that as well. That's something we'll talk more with staff about and try to get some more information and revisit that conversation. So any other last comments or questions before we wrap up? Well, thank you all for your time and um, your input, and we'll look forward to seeing you in October. I just want to mention really quickly, uh, if you did want to grab the printed version of the worksheets we didn't get to, so that includes safety, environmental conservation, open uh, space and recreation, and public facilities and services, uh, we do have those over by the door. It's the same format as what's going to be online, but it might just be helpful to have a printed version, scratch it up, and then submit those comments on the online survey.